Okay, welcome back. Family Bible time. We're in 1 Kings and 2 Chronicles again. 1 Kings 16 and 2 Chronicles 17. 1 Kings 16 and 2 Chronicles 17. Let's pray. Father, we pray for your help as we read your word. Please... um, Teach us, Lord, we know that we need your word as food day by day. Please help us as we uh, look to you, Lord. Um, You're the only one who can feed us. We pray that you would, in Jesus' name. Amen. 1 Kings 16 and 2 Chronicles 17. Got it? Okay. And the word of the Lord came to Jehu. I just got told off by my wife. I always think of him as Jehu. The son of Jafar. No, the son, the son of Hanami. This is Jehu or Jehu, if you're me. Um, this is the... If you're going to call him Jehu, you have to call Onesimus Onesimus. Um, and other fun names in the Bible. Um, anyway, this is this is Jehu, the son of Hanani. This is not Jehu, the king. This is Jehu, the prophet. The word of the Lord came to Jehu, the son of Hanani, against Baasha, saying, remember Baasha is the king of Israel. Israel. Well done, top marks saying, Since I exalted you out of the dust and made you leader over the, my people Israel, and you have walked in the way of Jeroboam and have made my people Israel to sin, provoking me to anger with their sins, behold, I will utterly sweep away Baasha and his house, and I will make your house like the house of Jeroboam, son of Nebat. Uh, anyone belonging to Baasha who dies in the city, the dogs shall eat. And anyone who dies in the field, the birds of the heavens shall eat. Well, they obviously had wild dogs. And they had, um, obviously, wild birds. Now, the rest of the acts of Baasha and, and what he did... <laughs> And his might, are they not written in the book of the chronicles of the kings of Israel? And Baasha slept with his fathers and was buried at Terzah. And Elah, his son, reigned in his place. Now, that's a very good example again of um, a, an idiom. He slept with his fathers. What does, what's that an idiom for? It's a figure of speech, isn't it? It's just saying he died. When it says he slept with his fathers, it's just saying he died. And and so one of the things about um, figures of speech and idioms like that is, is that you mustn't read too much into them. You mustn't over-exegete a figure of speech. Um if you started trying to interpret that by saying, oh, he he slept with his fathers, what does that mean? You're missing the point, right? It just It's a figure of speech and it's just saying he died. You know that because it says he was buried at Terza. And Elah, his son, reigned in his place. Moreover, the word of the Lord came by the prophet Jehu to the son, the son of Hanani, against Baasha and his house, both because of all the evil in the sight of, he did in the sight of the Lord, provoking him to anger with the work of his hands in being like the house of Jeroboam, and also because he destroyed it. Do you remember Baasha rose up against... Oh, did I put it on Do Not Disturb? No, I didn't. All right, we're going to have to pause this. I need to answer this. Excuse me.
Can you go and pause it, please, darling? Okay, my apologies. I had to answer a call. Um, verse 8. In the 26th year of Asa, king of Judah, Elah, the son of Beersha, began to reign over Israel in Terzah. And he reigned two years. But his servant Zimri, commander of half of his of of half his chariots, conspired against him. When he was at Terza drinking himself drunk in the house of Arza, who was over the household of Terza, over the household in Terza, Zimri came in and struck him down and killed him. In the twenty seventh year of Asa, king of Judah, and reigned in his place. So now, Elah, the son of Baasha, began to reign. Then Zimri came, out, came and killed him. It's terrible, isn't it? It's just like one disaster following another. This is it all in Israel. But do you remember from yesterday how it times it? It times it as saying, it was in the 27th year of Asa, king of Judah, that this happened. So you have to be careful not to get confused because you think, oh, is it talking about Judah or Israel? No, it's talking about Israel still. When he began to reign, as soon as he had seated himself on his throne, verse 11, he struck down all the house of Baasha. So now the same thing's happening to Baasha as Baasha did um, before him. He did not leave him a single male of his relatives or his friends. Thus Zimri destroyed all the house of Baasha according to the word of the Lord, which he spoke against Baasha by Jehu the prophet. For all his son for all his sins, for, for all the sins of Baasha and the sins of Eli his son, which they sinned and which they made Israel to sin, provoking the Lord God of Israel to anger with their idols. Now, the rest of the acts of Elah and all that he did, are they not written in the book of the Chronicles of the Kings of Israel? In the 27th year of Asa, king of Judah, Zimri reigned seven days. Not even as long as the nine-day queen <laughs> in Terza. Now the tro troops were encamped against Gibbethon, which belonged to the Philistines, and the troops who were encamped heard it. So, who were encamped heard it, said... Heard it said. Oh, thank you. They heard it said... Zimri has conspired and he has killed the king. Therefore all Israel made Omri, the commander of the army, king over Israel that day, in the camp. So Omri went up from Gibbethon and all Israel with him, and they besieged Terza. And when Zimri saw that the city was taken, he went into the citadel of the king's house and burned the king's house over him with fire, and died, just like Denethor, <laughs> king of Gondor. Only Denethor, king of Gondor, is not a real fit, real person. That's from Tolkien. Well, it is a real person. It's just acting. <laughs> mm. But this is probably where Tolkien got it from. Because Tolkien read his Bible, didn't he? He wasn't a believer, I don't think, but he did read the Bible. Um, someone's going to contradict me on that. I think he 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 was a Roman Catholic, um, which is what I mean by not being a believer. He wasn't born again, I don't believe. And when... Oh, I've read that. Verse 19, because of his sins that he committed, 
doing evil in the sight of the Lord, walking in the way of Jeroboam, and for his sin which he committed, making Israel to sin. Now the rest of the acts of Zimri and the conspiracy that he made, are they not written in the book of the Chronicles of the Kings of Israel? Then the people of Israel were divided into two parts. Half of the people followed Tibni, the son of Ginnath, to make him king, and half followed Omri. I've spilt something here. I must remember to clean it up afterwards, sorry. Um, but the people who followed Omri overcame the people who followed Tibni, the son of Ginnath. So Tibni died, and Omri became king. In the 31st year of Asa, king of Judah, Omri began to reign in Israel, over Israel, and he reigned for 12 years. Six years he reigned in Terza. He bought the hill of Samaria from Shema for two talents of silver, and he fortified the hill and called the name of the city that he built Samaria. Oh, that's the origin of the city called Samaria. After the name of Shema, the owner of the hill. There's a little bit of Bible trivia for you. Um, what's the origin of the name of Samaria? Well, it was Omri that bought it from Shema, and the hill was named after Shema. Shemaria. Anyway, there we go. It's fun, isn't it? Fun fact. This is not such a fun fact. Verse 25, Omri did what was evil in the sight of the Lord, and did more evil than all who were before him. And that's saying something, because Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, was before him, but now he's going to keep going with the sin of Jeroboam, Look, for he walked in all the way of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, and in the sins that he made Israel to sin, provoking the Lord, the God of Israel, to anger by their idols, so he obviously did the same things, but he went further. Now the rest of the acts of Omri that he did and the might that he showed, are they not written in the book of the Chronicles of the Kings of Israel? And Omri slept with his fathers and was buried in Samaria. And Ahab, you can now spit again, Ahab his son reigned in his place. I really hope none of you are actually spitting in your living rooms. If you are, talk to your parents about it. In the 38th year of Asa, king of Judah, Ahab, the son of Omri, began to reign over Israel. And now you can boo and hiss and spit all at the same time. Ahab is going to be the worst of the lot. And Ahab, the son of Omri, did evil in the sight of the Lord more than all who were before him. It's just getting worse and worse and worse. Yeah, and if it had been a li as if it had been a light thing for him to walk in the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, he took for his wife Jezebel, the daughter of Eth Baal, king of the Sidonians, and went and served Baal and worshipped him. He erected an altar for Baal in the house of Baal, which he built in Samaria, and Ahab made an Asherah. Ahab did more to provoke the Lord, the God of Israel, to anger than all the kings of Israel who were before him. In his days, Heel of Bethel built Jericho. Remember what the Lord said about Jericho? Heel, the son of Heel of Bethel, built Jericho. He laid its foundation at the cost of Abiram, his firstborn, and set up its gates at the cost of his youngest son, Segub. 
according to the word of the Lord which he had which he spoke by Joshua the son of Nun. Ah, oh, well, I'm sorry I'm going so slowly, but what a chapter. Hopefully you've managed to speed me up. Uh, 2 Chronicles chapter 17. 2 Chronicles chapter 17. You can't speed me up, can you? you have no, we to, can't, but they can. You have to put up with me on single speed. Jehoshaphat says his fun son reigned in his place and strengthened himself against Israel. He placed forces. <laughs> he placed. For, so now, we're, hold on a minute. We're in. Where are we? We're in Judah. So we're in Judah. So. We're, what? He said, where are we? And I said, Verse 2. Mummy understood me. I'm saying, okay, we're not in Israel now, we're in Judah. Jehoshaphat, his son, who's Jehoshaphat's dad? Asa. Asa, what do you say? Asa got an A. We say, yay for Asa. That wasn't that funny, was it? <laughs> <laughs> So, but he, he had a good son, Jehoshaphat. Mm, he starts well, at least. Remember Asa? Didn't do so well right at the end. Jehoshaphat's going to be even worse at the end. But he started well. Jehoshaphat, his son, reigned in his place and strengthened himself against Israel. He placed forces in all the fortified cities of Judah and set garrisons in the land of Judah and in the cities of Ephraim that Asa his father had captured. The Lord was with Jehoshaphat because he walked in the earlier ways of his father David. He did not seek the Baals. The Baals would be like a title for all the false gods. But sought the God of his father and walked in his commandments and not according to to the practices of Israel. Therefore the Lord established the kingdom in his hand. Now put your finger there for a moment and look back to verse 9 in chapter 16. You need to have verse 9 in your mind. I've got it printed on the wall in my office. Um, because this is just a reminder for me all the time the eyes of the Lord, for the eyes of the Lord, this is chapter 16, verse 9, for the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to give strong support to those whose heart is blameless toward him. You have done foolishly in this, from now on you shall have wars. This is, this is both a promise and a warning, isn't it? It's God is looking for people whose hearts are blameless towards him. So how's your heart? You can't hide your heart from God, can you? Man looks on the, at the outward appearance, but the Lord sees the heart, doesn't he? So God knows what you're really thinking. God knows what you really are. So what's the solution? What do you do when you see sin in your heart? You've got to repent of the sin in your heart, haven't you? You've got to ask God to forgive you and change you on the inside so that you love him. You've got to ask God to help you to hate the sin that you love and love the good that you hate. And to be blameless towards the Lord, to turn away from sins in your heart. If you find sins in your heart, if you find jealousy, if you find pride, if you find anger, if you find lust, if you find um, deceit in your heart, if you look at something and you want to steal it in your heart, even if you never steal it with your hands, you've got to repent of it in your heart because the Lord is looking for your heart to be blameless before him. But now here's the encouragement. The Lord is looking for that, but when he sees it, 
he gives strong support to the one whose heart is blameless before him. Isn't that wonderful? So now here's Jehoshaphat. And it says his heart was courageous. Uh, uh, maybe I've gone too far, have I? Yeah. In verse 5 is where I stop. Therefore the Lord established. Why, what's the therefore? Well, because he sought the Lord, the God of his fathers, to and walked according to his commandments. Therefore the Lord established the kingdom in his hand. It's God who establishes the kingdom, right? It's God who rules over the nations. It's God who rules over churches. It's God who rules over families. You want your family to be established. You want your church to be established. You want your country to be established. What do we need to do? We need to individually, all of us, repent at the heart level and seek the Lord for his favor. And he can, he's the one who can bless us. And if he doesn't bless us, we won't be blessed. Verse 6, his heart was courageous in the ways of the Lord. And furthermore, he took the high places and Asherim out of Judah. Everyone says, yay for Jehoshaphat. Jehoshaphat, Jehoshaphat. Two, four, six, eight. Who do we appreciate? Jehoshaphat. Jehoshaphat. Um... I don't know. I mean, this is this is good stuff, isn't it? He took the high places away. You remember Asa? He did all that good, and yet it says, but he didn't take away the high places. And I said, we don't write him off, do we, just because he failed in that level. Now, here's, here's Jehoshaphat. Maybe your children will, if you pray... Maybe your children will follow the Lord even more faithfully than you did. How wonderful would that be? Maybe you'll be able to do things. Maybe you'll be able to see sins that, and failures that we have and follow the Lord even more closely. That would be wonderful, wouldn't it? In the third year of his reign, he sent his officials, Ben-Hail, Obadiah, Zechariah, Nethanel, Micaiah, and Micaiah to teach in the cities of Judah. I love Jehoshaphat at this point in his life. Mm -hmm. So he's, he's making reforms, but now he's sending out Bible teachers. Mm -hmm. And with them the Levites, Shemaiah, Nethaniah, Zebediah, mm -hmm. Asahel, Shemiramoth, Jehonathan, Adonijah, Tobijah, and too bad Anijah. <laughs> it's as good a name as Onceimus, isn't it? <laughs> I think. Uh, and with these Levites, I mean that guy was a hero. <laughs> Maybe his preaching wasn't so good, but <laughs> and with these Levites, the priests Elishama and Jehoram, and they taught in Judah, having the book of the law of the Lord with them. They went throughout all the cities of Judah and taught among the people. And the fear of the Lord fell upon all the kingdoms of the land that were around Judah. And they made no war against Jehoshaphat. See, this is what we just don't get, do we? It's God who, God who can give us peace. It's God who can give us protection. Some of the Philistines brought Jehoshaphat presents of silver for tribute. See, remember the proverb? When a man's ways please the Lord, he makes even his enemies to be at peace with him. Do you remember that proverb? And now look at what's happening. Some of the Philistines brought Jehoshaphat presents of silver for tribute, and the Arabians also brought him 7,700 rams, 7,700 goats. 
And Jehoshaphat grew steadily greater. He built in Judah fortresses and store cities, and he had large supplies in the cities of Judah. He had soldiers, mighty men of valor in Jerusalem. This was the muster of them by fathers' houses. Of Judah, the commanders of thousands, Adnar, the commander of with 300,000 mighty men of valor. And next to him, Jehohanan, a commander with 280,000 men. So that's 580,000 men, half a million men. And next to him, a Messiah, the son of Zikri, a volunteer for the service of the Lord with 200,000 mighty men. Now we're up to 700,000 mighty men of valor. Of Benjamin, Eliada, a mighty man of valor with 200,000 men, that's 900,000, armed with bow and shield. And next to him, Jehozabad, um, with 180,000 armed for war. That's more than a million men armed and ready for war. These were in the service of the king, besides those whom the king had placed in the fortified cities throughout all Judah. Now, do you remember before when the Ethiopians came up against Asa? Mm -hmm. I said Asa had about half a million men, just over half a million men, and the Ethiopians came with a million men. Now, the people of Judah and Benjamin have more than a million men. And so this is a mum, a mum, this is a mum, a mum, mum. This is a mum. <laughs> <laughs> this is a I'm sorry I'm tired. This is a this is a moment in the life of Judah the nation um when Jehoshaphat is really um pleasing the Lord and doing mightily isn't he? So and the the country's getting is is becoming successful, and he's becoming very rich. If you look at chapter eighteen, we're not going to read that. If you look at chapter eighteen, verse one, now Jehoshaphat had great riches and honor. Oh no! It, see, it's then that it's all going to go wrong, and we'll pick up on this tomorrow. And I was thinking about this earlier when I. Um, I listened to this earlier and just tried to think it through. Um, I was thinking what an amazing, painful lesson this is for pastors and for leaders, for, for politicians, for kings, for anyone, for fathers in households. The, the danger for us, the great danger for us, seems to always come if we're being faithful if we're being godly and the lord blesses us the danger seems to come especially when we're when we're blessed it seems to come especially when we have a little bit of security when things are going well it was like that for asa and and, and it's towards the end of his life and he sometimes it's after you've had a great victory great danger great danger and um, we need to take this reminder don't we the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to give strong support to those whose heart is blameless toward him as I listened to all this earlier and was thinking about it I just had me thinking Lord please make me blameless to the end make me seek you more in my uh, older age than I did in my youth. Make me seek you more closely if you give me um, more success, Lord. Give me more um, desire to, to be honourable to you. And I think there's a great warning for us, but also a great encouragement. Look, if we commit ourselves to the Lord... It's nothing that the Lord can't do for us. There's no reason why the Lord can't revive us, can't change our country, can't change our families, can't change our churches. 
Lord, we pray that you would. We pray that you would draw us out to be steadfast and blameless towards you. Please have mercy upon us. Please bless us. Please be gracious to us. Be gracious to us by humbling us, Lord, by making us dependent upon you. Whatever it takes, Lord, if it takes weakness, if it takes difficulty, we would rather have that with humble dependence upon you than, than to become proud. Lord, never let us become proud. Please don't let us become arrogant and sin and then incur your wrath and your your discipline. We pray this for Jesus' sake. Amen. God bless you. We are again, God willing, back tomorrow. Thank you for your help, my little camera meister. We'll see you tomorrow. God bless you. Bye.